Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dana White. Welcome to the Myth Salon. I couldn't be happier today to have Louis Schwartzberg and the topic of gratitude as the topic of our Myth Salon discussion. Many of you are aware that recently I went to Italy for about a month on a cooking project. The book is titled One Step Gratitude, One Step Trust. Why gratitude? Why trust? Well, gratitude comes out of love, acceptance, the feeling that those forces, those ancestors, that history, these memories, they all influence who we are. And to the extent that we can completely accept what we are, what brought us here, we can trust going forth is going to nurture us into the future. This remarkable woman has a family over in Gravina, Italy, in Puglia. And we were over there for three and a half weeks going into restaurants, dealing with food vendors, expressing gratitude for the ground, for the supplies, for the people, everywhere we went. We were welcomed in like you couldn't believe. I would also like to say that today is my mom's birthday and she passed on a few years ago and I'll never have enough gratitude for the courage and the tolerance and the patience that she offered me to become who I am. So with that going forth, what I would like to do is have a moment of silence. Let's do our singing bowl. Now, as you know, I'm always searching for the right poem. It's a little like standing at a still point in the circle of a vast universe, turning in one direction after another, after another. Every poem a path, every poem a window into someone else's journey, each word a stone talking. One particular tree among many bending to filter meaning, a sky crying tears of gratitude, that no matter how much rain, there is always enough. No poem is the poem, though every poem points the way. Every poem is right, perfect. Yet every poem somehow misses because of its imperfections. And that's the beauty. I feel grateful just to be on the path of discovery. I feel grateful searching for something I really don't need. It is enough to be awakened to the opportunity. Whatever I discover, I will share. So, welcome everyone. What a beautiful day we have. Let me turn it over to one single man that I am completely grateful for. He said yes, maybe five, six years ago when we started the Miss Salon. And we've built a body of work that really has a jewel in the crown today. So thank you, Louis. And let's, let's go, Will. Cool. Thank you, Dana. Um, and thank you for sharing what's going on with you. Uh, it's a, one of those days where uh, if we're going to be talking about gratitude, it's so easy to talk about gratitude when things are good and in the context of the good stuff. Um, but I'll bet that a lot of people, uh, as you're talking about with your mother 
many of us tonight are most interested in how gratitude relates to us when things are tough. Um, so thanks for bringing that in. You all know Dana White, who's host of the Myth Salon, contributing faculty to Pacifica's Myth Degrees and author of numerous volumes on mythology. I'm Will Lynn, moderator of our evening, story producer and host of a series for ZDF Sky and History Channel called Myths, The Greatest Mysteries of Humanity. We're joined as usual by our friend, Dr. Dennis Patrick Slattery, who is a distinguished emeritus professor in the Mythological Studies Program at the Pacifica Graduate Institute. Dennis is the author, co-author, or editor or co-editor of 31 volumes, including seven of poetry and one novel. His latest book is The Fictions and Our Convictions, Essays on the Cultural Imagination. His paintings, pottery, blogs, books, and upcoming events can be found at DennisPatrickSlattery.com. Terry Ebinger is back with us tonight, who is a film and media scholar responsible for Cinema and Psyche, a website which feature, features her emphasis on a psychological and mythological approach to film studies. Throughout over three decades of private practice, she served as therapist, mentor, depth psychological educator, dream consultant, archetypal spiritual director, multidisciplinary group leader, and professional supervisor. She holds bachelor's degrees in psychology and media studies from Webster's University and a master's in clinical counseling from California State East Bay. Welcome back, Terry. Thank you. Also back with us tonight after last week on our climate event is my dad, Michael Lynn, who is a climate activist, inventor, and entrepreneur with a broad background in energy, software, technology, finance, and organizational process. He helped build and sell a company to Microsoft, design the Department of Energy Information Systems, and to win the 2014 ASHRAE Global First Place Tech Award for Educational Buildings. He is passionate about creating a sustainable world, social justice, and helping orphans overcome poverty. He's a graduate of Harvard Business School and Harvard College co-chairman of the Climate Bootcamp, a joint project of climate reality and Harvard alumni for climate and the environment. Uh, he has five sons and lives with Barbara in Destin, Florida. And now uh, I wanna thank Corinne Bordeaux, who is responsible for this evening uh, in this conversation. Corinne is the founder and visionary behind 360 Degree Communications, a leading entertainment marketing company that specializes in environmental and social justice films and conferences. She's worked on the Academy Award-winning films, The Cove, Free Solo in films such as Fantastic Fungi, Biggest Little Farm, Wildlife, Sea of Shadows, Wild Hope, All That Breathes, and many others. Corinne is also founder and the director of the Esalen Film Festival. She is a graduate of the Pacifica Graduate Institute and also recently completed the Pacifica Eco Psychology Program. And now it's my honor to welcome Louis Schwartzberg. Louis is an award winning cinematographer, director, and producer whose breathtaking imagery uses time lapse high-speed and macro cinematography techniques to celebrate life and to reveal the mysteries and wisdom of nature, people, and places. Louis' theatrical release includes the 3D IMAX film, Mysteries of the Unseen World with National Geographic, narrated by Forrest Whitaker, the theatrical feature, uh, Wings of Life for Disney Nature, narrated by Meryl Streep, and America's Heart and Soul for Walt Disney Studios. You probably know him from Fantastic Fungi, in which he explores the world of mushrooms and mycelium, which mm as we were talking about before we joined, has penetrated many of our lives. You know, friends who moved and changed their careers around inspiration from that movie. I was at a mushroom farm just this summer that my brother's good friend put together. Louis' three TED Talks have gone viral with over 60 million combined views and his Netflix series, Moving Art, is in its third season. You might also know him from the Disney rise, Soaring Around the World. Today, we're talking about his film, Gratitude, and I'm hoping we'll also find a chance to talk about another project of his, which is incredibly relevant to our motley community of psychologists, mythologists, and storytellers. Currently, Louis is developing Visual Healing, an immersive health and wellness program maximizing his award-winning body of work to reduce stress and anxiety. Visual Healing has been piloted at the new Billion Dollar Jacobs Medical Center at UCSD, as well as the Dallas Center for Brain Health. It forms part of the wellness programs at Post Ranch Big Sur, Cavallo Point Inn, Kamalia Resort, Koi Samoy, sorry about that, it must be in Hawaii, uh, and many others. Um, when I watch your films, Louis, it's always a heavy dose of healing, imagery, and insights. We're so grateful that you're here with us tonight. Really looking forward to learning with you and having this conversation. Thanks for being with us, and, and we'll jump into conversation. It's an honor to be with all of you. You know, I thought, you know, just as an easy <clears throat> place to start, my dad and I, we had a chance to meet you over at your place and yeah. when we were there we saw that you have like cameras going all the time i like i just thought i'd ask like wh what do you what does what is the camera on right now while we're talking that you're um, most excited about yeah like a, a big beautiful white tiger lily mm -hmm. and um a uh a lupin 
a purple Amazing. flower. Yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll, in the course of this uh, conversation, we will record probably like a half a second of film on both cameras. Wow. Wow. Thank God. Well, I want to invite everybody to turn off their mutes and join us. We're going to have a little bit more of a free flowing conversation than usual. Usually we start with a, a kind of a presentation, but we've shared the link and, and are inviting everybody uh, to watch the film. It'll come out. Uh, we'll continue to send out the link as long as it's live. It'll be a limited time that you can see the film. Gratitude. Um, but with that, I thought I would, I would just open it up to the panel and see who, who wants to dive in and who has an initial question or thought or feeling after having seen the film. Let me ask you a question. I moved up to Santa Cruz, which is one of the places where the monarchs have a, uh, a stopover on their way south. And it is dramatic. I mean, you can feel the ecosystem responding when these monarchs take to the trees. So how did you first come to associate the movements of nature with psychological conditions, with, with how human beings interact with the, I mean, why, how did that come about? Yeah, well, because we are nature. And so observing the patterns and rhythms of, of animals and plants is really the blueprint of who we are. And the perfect example, I think, would be the monarchs. Um, we filmed them in the highlands of Mexico. And what they do is they branch off actually kind of like in three directions. The main migration goes from the highlands of Mexico straight up the middle Midwest to Canada. There was a branch that goes off towards Big Sur and Santa Cruz, that, that's as mm -hmm. far as they go. And they come back and there's a little one that goes to Georgia. But think about this. We're, we're shooting the monarchs and I'm with the scientific expert, Chip Taylor from University of Kansas and like, you know, uh, got a big old white beard. And, and so he's the monarch expert. I'm going, okay, well, like a little kid, I go, well, what, what motivates their behavior? You know? And he goes, oh, it's all about risk, risk and reward. And then I said, well, um, but, but why? Well, because, you know, I guess they want to survive, but why, you know, well, they need to, um, I thought he was going to say like, you know, reproduce, but what he actually said was that, in the course of reproduction, because everything in the universe wears out, life is a force of energy that goes through us generation through generation. And the monarchs are the beautiful story of that. And I thought, fuck, what a genius invention called reproduction that enables, <laughs> you know, life force and your DNA uh, combo, which is your family, to go forward. And every, and every person, plant, animal has that as the top of their agenda you know and i think when you fall into that belief system you you lose your fear of of dying because you realize you're just like a link in this connection of life of energy that's what the monarchs do they reproduce along the way to canada the grandchildren of the monarchs fly from canada two thousand miles back to the highlands of mexico to the same four or five acres, nobody knows how they do that. Nobody knows how they can navigate that. You know, they got their brain that's smaller than a pinhead. So that's inspiration for like <laughs> um, how we can live our lives. Yeah. And uh, I can't, before we go on, I can't let this go unnoticed. I mean, that's beautiful, Louis. And Dana was sneaking something in there. And it's that and I don't know if everybody was meant to pick up on it, but he asked about butterflies in the context of the connection of imagery and psyche. But Dana damn well knows that butterfly, the word for butterfly is psyche. <laughs> oh, yeah. And there's been more poems and love letters and art and music um, written with the butterfly as being, I think, the primary, you know, like uh, animal or insect. I mean, because it's all about metamorphosis. It's all about change. Yeah. So the butterfly has always been that symbol of, of a spiritual transformation. Yeah. Louis, when I watched your um, unfolding flowers, um, it made me feel grateful to be alive. So I'd watch them again. And I would feel that gratitude again. So it, these, these uh, creations of yours are like blessings 
Thank you. Or the rest of us. Yeah. One area I'm just fascinated with, and uh, when we get to the place on um, images and healing, I want to say a couple of things, but I'm fascinated by how you have so successfully married artifice to the movement of nature's natural unfolding. That that um, marriage just fascinates me, and I'm sure it fascinates others. Yeah. But you just uh, maybe make some observations. Yeah, on... that I think that's a very, very astute question, you know, <laughs> um, because like otherwise somebody says, oh, he's a really great tech technologist, you know, yeah. really high quality films, you know, technically, but um, I'm, uh, I'm capturing rhythms and patterns of nature, and I do it in the most highly uh, technologically quality um, approach as well, because beauty is part of the story. Beauty is nature's operating instructions it's like the score you know it's not like an artifice it's not something on the surface i mean i wake up every day i have asked myself what is beauty you know and you ask that question to anybody i swear to god you'll floor them because they won't come up with an answer you know mm -hmm. they'll have to really think about it if they're really conscious you know right. not like oh that's like vogue magazine it's not but <laughs> the, that and I think my 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 history of, of you know directing commercials for fifteen years taught me a lot about how to do it you know the best way possible, and and to to extract the greatest amount of emotion. In that case, obviously to sell a product, right? But we have the best art directors, the best lighting, the best everything, best wardrobe, because we're we're, we're pressing the buttons of color and shape and rhythm and. Um, you know, all the things that we're hardwired to react to. Yeah. And that's an emotional, uh, it's an emotional play, right? Yeah. You know, and so you're, you're noticing the combo of both. And I got to tell you, it's just the emotion of the fact that beauty turns you on makes, the, makes the academic information palatable. <laughs> <laughs> if you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. I mean, because I, I put the science on the table. Like I'm not taking credit for being a genius or, or even an artist because I'm capturing nature's rhythms and patterns, but there's also the scientific explanation. What is pollination? What is reproduction? What is fungi? What is mycelium? I mean, it's great having the real scientific academic um, information so that you understand the concept. Then when you see the language of beauty, how it expresses itself, how it turns you on in order to protect it, i.e. now you became an environmentalist. You know, yeah. without and and like we you know we, we know that's really important. We got to get the spirits up for people to not feel despair. Well, guess what? If you lean into that, if you lean into being turned on by nature, you will make all the right choices to protect nature. You will become an activist, environmentalist, big time. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you for that. I, ha I have to comment to that. Uh, we were lucky in the climate boot camp to have Louis do a presentation and share some of his imagery with the boot camp. And one of our biggest challenges was and is that people, as they study the climate situation, have a tendency to become depressed and have a tendency to become paralyzed. Mm -hmm. We got an overwhelming response from people that the boot camp was uplifting. Mm -hmm. We're focusing on solutions and we ended with Louis talking about gratitude and with these beautiful images of nature. What, Louis, what we haven't talked about is I also occasionally talk to older people about second, third careers. And sometimes you find particularly older people who I would almost classify as living to die. And I actually use your films with wow. those people as a, a gateway to reopen their hearts and reopen their eyes. Because I think we live in a society where you can just be indoors all day long and be completely dis detached. I'd like for you to talk a little bit more about what you see as the actual clinical use, the, the helping individuals and groups out of dep depression is a toxic disease in our society. 
particularly among older people. Would you talk a little bit about sure. that? Absolutely. Well, I think that, you know, um, nature, I think, is medicine. I think we all kind of agree upon that. And therefore, like, why not bring that energy, um, let's say, into the, you know, living spaces where elderly people are? I mean, watching Fox News all day long, I would say it's very toxic, you know? <laughs> um, so we have to give people choice, have to give them an alternative. Um, I think that the, you know, we used to live in the forest probably 200, 300 years ago. We all did. We all lived outdoors. We all lived in nature. And so being able to look at nature is, I think, a couple of emotions that come really strongly. It's like a homecoming. All of a sudden, you're reconnecting with your soul. It's like, ah, you can breathe. Like, I'm back home. You know, it's like, ah, you know. And um, that's one one big thing. And that just the vibrations of, of color wavelength energy um, has, has been, you know, modifying our behavior for, you know, tens of thousands of years, you know. You know, I'm wearing aqua blue shirt because that, you know, represents water and water represents survival. You know, you ask people for the what they love in terms of color therapy and in healthcare, they they tune that into you know our DNA connection to survival, to water, to green, to things you want to be surrounded with. Well, that's that's a vibration of energy that's hitting your retina, that's sending impulses to your brain, that's creating an emotion, a mood that is is pretty powerful. And so let's not throw away these digital devices. Like 80% of the data we get comes into our eyes. We got healing modalities for like for for um you know, for smell, you got aromatherapy. For music, we have hearing. We have massage for touch, healthy food for taste, and vision is the most important sensory receptor we have. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I think, you know, uh, I feel I'm able to activate, and especially you're saying with, with, uh, with older people, it's like looking into a mirror, into the energy of life, because what you're looking at is a reflection of the rhythms and patterns that's going on inside of every cell of your body. Mm -hmm. Milky Way, right? The circulatory mm -hmm. system, my cellular network, they all have the same rhythms and patterns. So if you're watching stuff that is um, life affirming biologically, you, you were saying you'd love to look at the flowers open. You know, what you're saying is, come get me. I need to reproduce. <laughs> Let's get it on. You know, I'm trying to turn you on by color, by pattern, by smell, by aroma, by by nectar. You know, this is a real sexual yes. <laughs> you know, and there's and that's life. That's just saying DNA wants to move forward. It's not sexual in any way because the bee and the flower are in two different kingdoms. They can't reproduce with each other. And you see, that's where I get even a bigger explosion of. Of, of awareness of how nature should be our role model for behavior, because that's not a, a quid pro quo transaction. The yeah. bee gets nectar to feed its brood. And the mean, and, and by the way, moves the pollen around from flower to flower, because the flower can't reproduce, can't, can't walk, can't run, needs a messenger to send its DNA around to do the ultimate thing there is to do, move DNA forward. Life wants to go forward, right? DNA has got to go forward. Otherwise, we're all in one generation of anything. And so, anyways, it, it does that transaction. And then reciprocally, um, we are the beneficiaries of all that without getting even involved because we get the fruits, nuts, and vegetables. So they've got this thing going on where they're kind of enabling each other unknowingly. And if we just you know back off and, and don't mess it up and don't screw it up, Mm -hmm. Like killing the bees, you know, mm -hmm. we get all the fruits and nuts and, and vegetables and all the rewards because we're again enabling DNA to go forward by passing those seeds around. That's what animals do, right? It's so beautiful. It's such a win win scenario. It's such a good way for society to look at as a model for ecosystems to flourish. You know, it's survival. When I see your films, I feel that I'm experiencing what David Abram calls synesthesia. 
which is you have senses talking to one another. I, I hear sights, I see sounds. And yeah. these, these films that you make show such a sensitivity to the particular nature of what you're watching. And I can only imagine the difficulty of being down low on the ground with the mushrooms and watching <laughs> them, watching them when they're coming through the pine needles and and that whole sort of thing. I mean, it it it's alive. I feel I get goosebumps watching them because I want them to make it. I'm I'm cheering for them as if they're climbing a mountain, as if they're yeah. you know. And I, I just it is it's beautiful. Yeah. And, and but again, that's life force moving forward because the mushroom is the sexual organ of the mycelial network. It's popping up to release its spores. You know, it's yeah. saying, I mean, I love this idea of, of reproduction is the genius invention that enables life to go forward is really remarkable because everything wears out, like you know, Chip Taylor said. So life is a force of energy, you know? Yeah. And so much of um, the, the uh, third kingdom, uh, just the metaphors that just kept popping up as, uh, as I watched it, um, gave me the sense that the earth has an unconscious. Mm -hmm. and that's where so much of the funga, fung, fungi, what's the correct pronunciation? Either way, fungi oh. or fungi. Okay. The fungi, fungi, either way, G, G or G, either way. <laughs> Yeah. So all of this is going on right. networking yeah. everywhere, like the yeah. unconscious. I mean, they're, they're kind of a rhizome um, mm -hmm. quality, characteristics of it. Beneath the surface. It uh, was, was so rich. I mean, what, what you continue to point out is how so much of the created order is analogical. Mm -hmm. This is kind of like this, and then this is kind of like this, and then they're also uniquely different. But the paradox is through the uh, uniqueness, they're communal. Yeah, but, but that's a, another beautiful lesson that communities survive better than individuals. And that it's, a, it's mm -hmm. a beautiful shared economy without greed, the mycelial network under the ground. And that's how ecosystems flourish. And that's what, you know, it's so, you know, biomimicry and, and, and many other examples in biomimicry are beautiful examples that took millions of years of R&D to develop that are literally under your feet that we should model. It's just right there. It's so exciting. You know, biomimicry, I mean, I'm sure we all get excited when you hear about all the things one can do by taking that knowledge and using it, you know, in our human culture, you know? Yeah. yeah. We should model it and until I see it in stop motion, careful imagery, I can't even see myself in it because I don't even have the mirror to see myself through. And if I just, you know, live in my room all day or only watch Netflix or besides your show, of course, or only watch, <laughs> you know, whatever, then then where am I getting my mirrors? Right. My mirrors are limited. And what okay. you're saying about nature, give us back the mirrors of nature and so that we can see ourselves and see how we are like this. And so we can identify as right. interconnected and unselfish because it is there for us to see ourselves in yeah. if we let ourselves. And thanks. I, that's why I feel the gratitude for you giving imagery for us to be yeah, able thank to see. You. Well, well, yeah. well, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, I, I just launched the Louis channel. We have no other name for we it. We want to ask you about that. What's the yeah, Louis yeah, but channel? like it's because like you just mentioned, like instead of sitting around watching Netflix, watching this toxic, you know, entertainment because it's violent, it's about fear. It's you know, in, in Hollywood, and I'm a part of this world as well. But I'm just telling you flat out, they don't believe they can tell a story without conflict. They don't believe mm -hmm. a story yeah. can be told at all without those buttons that they press, which is like the revenge, anxiety, stress, you yeah. know, being cheated, being, being killed, <laughs> uh, being chased by a car. You know, everything is like pushing that fucking adrenaline cortisol button. And they call it, oh, we want to get people to be, you know, you know, lean in on the edge. Around and they're the getting cave. better and better at it. 
Well, yeah, because right. but that's the easiest part of the brain to to emote a, 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 an emotional reaction. It's fear. I, I point a gun mm -hmm. at you. I'm going to get a reaction. It doesn't take any talent to do that. Make people laugh and cry and fall in love. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of storytelling is, is a lot more. So I want to find a rant only because I wanted to say that I'm creating a platform and where everything is just positive um, stories mm -hmm. that celebrate life. Because I can't even handle, like, if I'm switching a channel and I'm going and I get a commercial that's so abrasive or it's a cop show, and all of a sudden I'm seeing bang, bang, bang. Yeah. I can't even handle two or three seconds of it because I understand that it is physiologically toxic to my health. And then yeah. we're going to discover this, I think, and one of the reasons why I think we've got this mental despair and maybe these mass shootings. By the time a kid grows up, you've probably seen 10,000 fucking murders on mm -hmm. TV. No. Then it's nothing... It doesn't mean any, and then in real life, we would never see a murder. We would never see any kind of, you know, physical violence the way we see it. And um, yeah, so we're kind of getting brainwashed in that way. It's in it just like, you know, they found out that smoking was bad for your lungs and fast food's bad for your, you know, for your, your body. Um, toxic imagery is also gonna, you know, be bad for your mind. And, and definitely probably shorten your lifespan as well, your health. Well, it, we're a bunch of mythologists and depth psychologists and dream interpreters. That's like, you know, that's like ally talk there. Yeah. <laughs> and honestly, it's right up Terry's alley. Uh, Terry, I wonder if you have any thoughts about, about imagery and healing. Oh, I have so many. <laughs> uh, first of all, Louis, I want to congratulate you for, li <clears throat> for living your genius. You know, Thank for you. following the call and modeling that in these ways that are now reaching so many people. As I was preparing today and I was doing some grounding, for the first time ever, I got the image of connecting to the mycelae. Uh, hmm. And that, that's so powerful. Um, so, yes, I worked with dreams for 30 years and then I transformed that into teaching film studies rooted in imagery, the kind of imagery we're talking about. And um, I'm really noticing today the, the allegorical interconnectedness thread that is so big in depth psychology, but so big also in eco psychology and eco, eco activism, that interconnectedness. But I wanted to highlight several things that really have meaning for me. One is yeah. as soon as I, I, I've been working my way out of an underworld round of despair. And it worked, it helped a lot last week that it was my birthday and I was just showered with love from every direction. And I was spending as much time in nature as possible. But then when I was um, invited to be part of this panel, I started immersing myself in your work. And it, it just, it, from the very moment I started watching, it re-inspired um, a calling uh, of a series called Movies as Medicine. And um, so that's activated in me and, oh, I can't wait to, you know, ground that. But huh. then the work, well, so the work about imagery is healing, of course, of course. It's so, it just makes so much sense to anyone who's paying attention. And uh, I was just so, and then it, it, you gave the three, is it the forest? Is it the, the undersea? Is it the flowers? And then I can't remember what the, the fourth one was. But, but anyway, so I started immediately thinking, well, which one would I want, you know? And at first it was flowers unfolding and now I'm settled on the undersea part. <laughs> you know, that's where I'm called right now. So, but my history is, my family is and was riddled with alcoholism. Mm -hmm. And three of my four brothers spent major time in prison. So this wound and seeing you, uh, you know, in this, uh, in the gratitude piece, how much spot time you spent with prisoners and them finding the gift in the wound, you know, the gift in the mm -hmm. wound is a huge calling for me in terms of teaching um, and using imagery, but just to see that it's so healing. It's so moving to me. Thank you so much for that. Uh, it just all the, and then, um, and then alcohol use disorder, of course, 
of course. I just love the possibilities of that. And I immediately start imagining how I could get part, family members to, you know, get mm-hmm. involved in this. But in the meantime, it works for me. It works for my own healing. Yeah. And the very first thing that came to my mind when I started watching your work was Angelus Arian, who was a really important mm-hmm. teacher of mine, um, a cross-cultural integrator and great teacher of indigenous wisdom. And she had a theory that there were four, there are four universal addictions, the addiction to perfection, the addiction mm-hmm. to intensity, the addiction to needing answers, and think about media and how primary that is and the final one the addiction to paying attention to what isn't working instead of what is working and I feel like your work is such an antidote to all of those but especially the last one because we're being trained by media right pay attention to what isn't working and it's it's a huge um you know cause of all this depression and despair yeah I wanted to throw a bunch of stuff out there but thank (laughs) you so much thank you that's great. Well, you know, we we act, I mean, literally finished a clinical trial at the Pacific Neuroscience Institute here in Santa Monica at, at St. John's, combining um, my visual healing with um, psilocybin, you know, mushrooms to mm-hmm. treat alcohol addiction. Mm-hmm. And uh, the combination was um, super successful. Um, there'll be, uh, we're, we're, the findings will be published, you know, hopefully soon. But uh, it was really groundbreaking, and the combination was better than even the psilocybin by itself. So it's pretty remarkable. But they, look, it's also really obvious. Like, duh, yeah, you is. want to be in a hospital room, or you want to be in Tahiti? You want to, <laughs> I mean, that, that's not exactly a, a hard decision to make, you know? Yeah. Anna, is this a good time to see some of this imagery for a second? Ooh, yeah. yeah. Oh, you have that queued up? I yeah. have I have something queued up. Let me um okay, sure. they're gonna fight me, for what they have queued up. But yeah, me, uh, I would love to me, see some imagery. Yeah, let me let me share something here.
You must oh. feel really proud <laughs> to have seen that and to have captured that. And, you know, I have a question following that, that your work reveals there's a collaborative win-win pattern in nature, you know, and it suggests that in addition to a biological dimension, there's a spiritual dimension to existence. Rami Shapiro said that the win-win is really the golden rule. And so do you see a spiritual dimension in, in addition to this biological dimension that you so <laughs> poignantly capture? Well, primarily I see the spiritual connection and the biological is, is a nice way to look at it from a different angle, you know? And I think I, I combine them because there, there's an audience for people who want the academic, you know, explanation, the biological, but there's an audience obviously that just wants to be able to enjoy the, the spiritual, um, emotional feeling that they get from being able to take a journey through time and scale, mm -hmm. slow-mo, time-lapse, micro, macro. I'm bending your conscious consciousness in a really good way. It, it's what, you know, psychedelics do in, in a similar way. Um, you know, I'm altering your perception of time and space, which makes you not, makes it difficult to categorize it, to put it in a cubbyhole. Oh, that's a butterfly. That's this, that's that. That's Yosemite. You know, it's like, we, we want to just label it and as if you know it, you don't know anything by giving it this utter sound. And now you say, oh, that's a shiitake. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, but to like, let go, watch it grow, look at the patterns, look at the gills unfolding. What is it saying to you? And how does it make you feel? Yeah. You know, um, and and that's a, a skill that needs to be nurtured as well, because we don't do that. Instead, you're being force fed this fear, you know, thing of car crashes and news and bad stuff and fear. Fear is easy to. Mm -hmm. It's the easiest way to get your attention is fear. Yeah. You know, so somehow we have to overcome that. Well, after seeing media, your, yeah. after seeing your your work, it's just impossible to walk by anything in nature, yeah. whether it's water or trees or uh, moving to Santa Cruz. We have waves that just come in one after the other. I mean, people riding on them. Um, a phrase that I heard in one of them was moral beauty. Mm. And, and it's as if you, you put a face on something. And I know the face that I'm seeing is a human face because I'm interpreting it through human senses. But it's as if you, you've allowed the divine to speak, you know, that, that by capturing it, by <laughs> slowing it down and letting it come forth, you, you are putting it out there in front of us and the only thing that gets would get any closer would be to be there with you you know no, it wouldn't even be. Then, <laughs> no no it, it, that it would not be that you it see. would not be fun to be with me i don't think what would you <laughs> say? You know, because i mean the truth is that all the shots going by it's like all nighters you know waiting for a bat to hit a flower you know montezuma's revenge i mean a lot of memories like that come back but um no, I, what what you were just saying though, I don't want to lose that thought. Um, um, oh, that look, it the fact that it speaks to you as the divine, yet comes from something as ordinary as a flower or a mushroom, like not like the Milky Way, not like God in some giant heaven. It's it's like you know in a hand something that's smaller that fits in your hand and an IE inside of you. And that's really, that's what's so cool is that then you realize you're surrounded by it. You know, yeah. it's all around. There's, there's a great uh, story from the Buddha's life, uh, this the, the Lotus Sutra, right? Where he holds up the Lotus and it's a statement of, you know, here's the, te the whole teaching today, you know? And of all the people that see it, only one person sees what he's trying to say. And it's this enlightenment moment. And uh, it's like, 
you made it more possible for more than just one of us to get that message. Mm. It's like, it's kind of like uh, in Lord of the Rings, the Ents speak so slow that no one can understand what nature <laughs> is saying. But it's like you took the, the overly slow, I can't actually hear the words of nature and sped them up into a register where we can observe it and recognize it and see yeah. it. Well, speaking of our friend, the Buddha, I, I also heard that, you know, before he ascended and under the Bodhi, Bodhi tree, he, all of his followers wanted like the last big word, what should we do? And he said, everything you need to know, you'll find in the face of a flower. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there's a Chinese proverb that says, if you give a man a fish, he eats for a day. If you teach a man to fish, you can feed for a lifetime. And you're teaching us how to fish. You don't show us an image. It teaches us how to look. And once you know how to look, you don't go yeah. back to consuming images. It's like you have now emotional prosperity. You've opened the door to awe. Ah, you know, uh, Datcher Keltner says that um, awe ah is the supreme emotion. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that if you if you want the wow factor, find something that kind of like motivates your myth. Get your get your juices going. So your vogue, your work does that. Your work evokes this awe. Ah. So how has awe ah been part of your spiritual journey and your healing journey? It's the ultimate. I mean, that's what I'm, I'm trying to make you feel wonder and awe. It means I've got to go out and find wonder and awe. <laughs> and I have to feel wonder and awe at yeah. the moment that I record. That's really critical because sometimes you know mm -hmm. people set up cameras, it's all perfect, and then they press the button, but they're not feeling it. I've always felt in a kind of a spiritually cosmic way, you have to feel it at the same time. But to make people feel wonder and awe, it means you're in front of something that's much bigger than you, like the Grand Canyon, you know. And so those vistas I do and all that. And at the mm -hmm. same time. To, to be a giant in the universe when you were looking at a close-up of a macro shot. So that's what elicits wonder and awe, <clears throat> to, to realize you're a speck in this grand universe. And that also eliminates fear of dying at the same time, because then you're, that's not a concern, you know? Wait, um, my favorite word that you said so many times in all of your work is wonder. I love that word. Yeah. So I looked, I looked up its etymology. Uh, it comes from the old English, wonder. Uh, it's a marvelous thing, an object of astonishment, another incredible word. And that it's the emotion that's inspired by such a sight. So, uh, I, right. I, and, and who knew that bats were um, pollinators? I had no idea. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so. And then, you know, one step further beyond that is that if they weren't, there would be no Sonoran Desert, which is 2,000 square miles. It goes all the way from Arizona right. to Mexico City. So, you know, because then there would be no cactus, you know, mm -hmm. and with no cactus. There's no birds. There's no insects. There's, I mean, the cactus, like the redwood tree and the bamboo tree to Asia, you know, it's like the key keystone species where ecosystems build around, you know. So that's how critical they are. It's just really <laughs> remarkable. And and then instead on media, every body thinks that every bat, I swear to God, 90% of the population, I guarantee believes that bats are bloodsuckers. Yeah. <laughs> and that, you know, they're vampires. Yeah. These are these are nectar feeding bats, you know. Yeah. And um it's just and then they they are unfortunately um not studied and abused. Mm -hmm. You know, people throw burning tires and caves and they'll um, fire crackers to you know, screw up their sonic hearing, which is such a miracle oh. beyond any technological, you wow. know, developments we've ever made with sonic imagery, how you can like bounce off of objects and fly in the swarm and never run into a rock or a cactus. I mean, it's like remarkable. It's remarkable. I wanted to ask a couple questions, questions about the filmmaking itself yeah. because well, and one is a deeper question. I'll start with that one and then I'll throw in the others. The deeper question is how do your dreams inform the work? 
And then um, the editing, the editing in all the work I saw is just so masterful to create the form, to make the connections, the interconnectedness that the editing is responsible for. Yeah. So I wanted to give a shout out for to Alan and Annie Wilkes. Yeah. Um, the editing is so remarkable. Yeah. It, it, there's so many connections. I'm speaking especially about the gratitude piece now. Yes. So many connections that just keep us moving and then coming back around again um, in this this incredibly mm -hmm. inspiring way. So well, to, to reply to the editing one because I'll forget the other one, but it's something I just realized as well because it's not scripted. If you're cutting something, it's a you know scripted you know story. Okay, you know, there's the guy walks in the door, he says hello, whatever the action is, you have all this like linear coverage. When I'm trying to express what is courage, what is gratitude, what is focus, and how do you take this one image that goes into the next image in order to make a cohesive sentence, you know, is a much more difficult skill, if yeah. not even an art form, yeah. because it, now it's more like poetry yes. as opposed to, let's say, a document. And that's why I don't even think my films are documentaries, because it's not a document. <laughs> I'm not documenting mm. anything. I'm, I'm, you know, stringing together visuals, you know, to tell a story, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, just, mm. There's yeah. got to be a lot of intuition in that. And I just watched something where Guillermo del Toro was talking about how he thought there were three entries to film or three expressions. One is a document. The second one, I'm not remembering right now, but yeah. the third one is sacrament. And mm -hmm. that's what these are. Mm. And they are in the pop, pop cultural world. I think, I don't know about y'all, but I have many friends who uh, th these films are, you know, the films you make are sacrament. They are related to people trying to find spiritual paths in a world that hasn't provided satisfying spiritual paths and people are out there looking for them. And right. your films find their way into those people's yeah. lives in meaningful ways. I love it, William. But in, what's what's part of the awareness I think I've had for a long time is that you can't tell people like what to believe in or what to do. And so even my gratitude film, there is nothing prescriptive in it. Think about that. I don't tell anyone how to live their life. Right. What you're watching are vignettes of other people that are courageous or passionate or adventurous or whatever. And then it's up to you to figure out what are you, what are you going to take from that? What did I learn or absorb or what insight did I get? So you have to do the work. And you have to come up with your own self-realization, which is the only way. It's the only way. We all can't believe one thing. I don't care what that thing is. That's dangerous. And, you know, we all know what that's like called religion and stuff, you know, creates a lot of war. You're seducing but, us. You're seducing <laughs> us. Just what nature does. I mean, we should all have the religion of no religion, you know? Mm -hmm. We all should have the religion that, that like, my insight of, of the reflection of nature is my point of view you know yeah. and I, I, I I wanna, that's it you know <laughs> corinne sorry i wanted to hear oh, your yeah no i have two through lines that i really want to go back to the first one is i'm fascinated in your first question louis do your dreams impact your work at all and then i want to follow yeah. up with another through line so that's the first through line they do but only in the editing process you know <laughs> i don't think they really inspire it you know because I'm experiencing things that are, you know, I'm curious about. I want to perhaps film, but definitely what's really weird is like I wake up in the morning and all of a sudden I'm told what to do. I'm literally just told what to do. I can't explain. And then I go in the cutting room and it fucking works. Like take this shot, move it over here, take that sequence, put it in front of that sequence. It, and I, I, tr I have a lot of trust in that because mm. I think that's your unconscious going through all the possibilities and everything that you've been struggling with and, and letting the kind of the, the silt come down to the bottom of the, of, the, of the bucket and then you get clear water. And when you get the clear water, then all of a sudden it's the, ah, I get it, you know? Yeah, yeah. and then yeah. the other through line that um, Will started, and I think um, this particular audience would just be thrilled to know more, is the Louis channel, because the Louis channel is kind of the antidote to all this negative, but, and some of the most incredible 
interviews you've done that are just normally people would just wouldn't find somewhere. So can yeah. I know we started down that tunnel, but can you expand a little? Well, sure. I mean, like, you know, Terry was saying she was really picking up on the word wonder. So we have like, you know, a, a whole podcast series on wonder and awe, you know, um, two seasons of it. And it's and the second season has been really great. I would say 90% of the people I spoke to were women and uh, it was just, you know, coincidental. I wasn't trying to be politically correct. And, uh, and a lot of women of color talking about how spirituality uh, brings them to wonder and awe, you know? And whether you're in, inside of religion or doing some other form of practice, Buddhist practice, it's, it is interesting because that's where spirituality is supposed to live in religion, you know? And so, yeah, those are the people that are trying to find it in the 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 existing formal you know structure. So there's great people who live there, <laughs> right? Yeah, and really amazing people. So that so the wonder and awe is part of it. I've also got one called Louis Land, where I want to have like imagery available for children's hospitals and, mm -hmm. and kids, um, and make it easy no matter where you are in the world, you could like you know access it. The whole idea is is to get rid of the gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. And to have it like what we're doing right now, we have a direct relationship with the people that are listening to us. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine in my 40 years of shooting, you know, it's gotten more and more open. And now that we have digital and internet, but imagine there only was like movies and there was only three networks. And then there, and it's always mm -hmm. been a situation where the conscious films we've been talking about making obviously has no home. As a matter of fact, even today it has no home. There is no cable channel, no broadcast channel, you know, and hardly any distributor. That's why I've self-distributed both Fantastic Fungi and Gratitude. There's no distributor that wants to step up to the table and take on something that, that they don't understand, you know? You wonder what the world would be like without uh, Corinne Bordeaux helping uh, so many of these well, types of films. You've, so many films like this have found you and you've helped them when there hasn't been a, a pathway for a lot of these movies that's so defined, you, you've defined and helped. Well, you know, my colleague, Kurt Ektabar has a lot. He's, he's amazing. Um, and he also works a lot on the distribution too. It, it really is a team. And Fantastic Fungi was actually one of the highlights of my career. I mean, I'm not just saying this because mm -hmm. Louie's here, because we, I usually work with big studios and a lot of money, you know, and a, like a little cookie cutter, let's go to the Academy Awards. And with mm -hmm. Louie, it was just like, it just like the movie. The distribution was like the movie. It was just off the charts. Anything was possible. There's no rules. Um, and it was just an amazing, I still remember opening night of Fantastic Fungi. We were up yeah. in San Francisco and there were lines around the corner each way of this huge, huge, huge theater. And I said, Louie, you've got to go down and do selfies with everyone or we're going to have so many because those people aren't getting in the theater. And hmm. Louis sat in there, did his stunning imagery. I mean, it's a night, like I'll have five nights that I remember at the end of my life, and that will be one of the five nights. So hmm. we just really oh. captured the zeitgeist and captured a need and a yearning. And I just give a lot of credit to, a credit to um, the whole team, but Louis and Kurt having the foresight to say, hey, we don't need to go through a traditional distributor. This isn't a traditional movie. Um, well, so I, it's, I'll, it's, I'll, it's, I, the credit goes to the mushrooms <laughs> <laughs> that told me to have to 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 have trust in it. Yeah, because we did like mm -hmm. a fundraiser in Portland for the initiative to decriminalize it in the state of Oregon. And I go, whatever, sure, I'll come up. And this, you know, we show it on a Sunday afternoon. I drive up, taxi drops me off at this theater. I see fantastic fungi on this marquee and that makes you feel really good. And then the biggest, boldest letters sold out. And the only people who would, who in the, the psychedelic society just use their Facebook page to tell people about it and the word spread. And I said, and that, and then after that, the mushrooms made it really clear to me that like, believe, you know, have faith and, and find a way to do it on your own. If no one else mm -hmm. will do it, you do it. Well, looking at breaking out of the box a little bit, could I screen share and go to your Louis channel and just yeah. run it up yeah. there and let's 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 see what we whether I can pull this off. Say, I just want to note for everybody in the community that Louis channel is free. Anyone can join mm -hmm. it. Anyone can watch it. It's just 
phenomenal. So just put that out there for people and we'll so, do it follow up. They should yeah, just have beautiful. this on at every doctor's office that currently plays and, news. And is do we want to watch the trailer? Do we want to do anything? Wait, wait, William, did you say that every doctor's office already is playing it already or they should? I, they should. I mean, they like, should. what else? They, they don't need news or sales channels. This is what should be I running. Know. What ought to be on there? I've had many people say they go to their dentist and they're streaming it off Netflix, which is not legal, but I'm totally down with it. Ah, I mean, when you're in a mm. dentist chair, that's when you really need it the most. Yeah, <laughs> we should. We should. Okay, so should I lose this or should we? Yeah, you say walk. Hit the trailer. Hit the trailer. Hit the trailer. 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 Yeah. Yes, I'm a filmmaker, <laughs> and I love to take audiences on journeys through time and scale. Nature is our greatest spiritual teacher. Mushroom, it's not like a vegetable, and it's not like an animal, but it's somewhere in between. They have incredible capacity to make things change very, very quickly. So if we can work with them, if we get it, you know, if humans get it, we can change this thing really fast. So I am super hopeful. Passion. It's something that everybody has inside, but not everybody can find it. Bewilderment is the holiest of holy experiences. You lose your hubris, and this becomes sacred in every moment. That's gratitude. Welcome, everyone, to the episode 12 of the Wonder and Awe podcast. I'm Louis Schwartzberg. I used art definitely as a therapeutic tool. My entire album, Brave Enough, was all about being brave enough to feel after loss. It creates for me inspiration. Genuine gratitude comes about as a result of a loving connection. And when you explore, you get more imagination than you already had. What a pleasure. Thank you. Oh, okay. Well, we will have to share that out. Oh, our- yeah, that that's yeah. really great. Yeah. Congratulations. That is, oh, that's sorry. really exciting. Thank you. Well, you know, there was an army of people that helped me make all those films, you know, uh, so they all deserve that kind of good vibration. It, it is an army. It's, it is a community. I mean, other than bats know, and mushrooms and, and butterflies. Well, I, mean, <laughs> I, all, I mean, yeah, I'm just protecting the little guy, but I just want to say that whether I had a dozen people or 80 to 90 people to shoot the monarchs up in the highlands of Mexico, it, it was, um, a group effort. What an amazing thing to get a group around. I, I was at JPL today, did the tour. I saw the Europa module that's going to Europa. It was really inspiring. And yeah. Um, and every you can feel it there. Everybody there has a sense that they're doing something meaningful. It's what they all talk about. It's like, you know, you see it in the way that they move through their environment. Not to say right. there's not bureaucratic stuff that stresses them out like everyone, but when, when you get a team together around something beautiful like that, it is itself a profound thing. I mean, what is it like to be with a group of people doing a thing like that? Yeah. What kinds of projects do you have on your drawing board in terms of moving out into the future other than, you know, I, I, nature is a big topic, but I, I sense that in the same way that you moved from the migration to the mushrooms, the fantastic fungi to gratitude. That if you turn that kaleidoscope or that prism a certain way, reality looks different. For sure. Yeah. I think you know. Look, I never really understood what the the connection was between you know gratitude and fungi until more recently. Um, mm. Part of gratitude revealed being made was because during COVID. 
I finally decided to go into my library and put together something I've been working on for decades, right? Because really it was difficult to go out and film. That's one reason. The other reason was coming out of the pandemic, the mental health crisis, this feeling of disconnection, despair. I mean, the perfect time for a film about gratitude. And so that all happened for like, kind of like, you know, real, um, re real reasons. But then the other thing that it dawned on me afterwards was if the essence of fantastic fungi was to take a journey under the ground, you know, to, um, to get nature's wisdom and nature's intelligence about ecos how ecosystems flourish, you know, that beautiful connection, that shared economy, then gratitude revealed as a journey into the soul to figure out how do you integrate that knowledge? How do you get that aha moment and work with your, improve your relationship with yourself, with your partner, with the people you work with, with your community, with the world? Um, because you can't just have an aha moment, you know, and oh, that's fucking brilliant. And then what do you, and, and not do anything. And same thing in, in, in the therapy now, it's, exploding everywhere with the psychedelic therapy i mean they don't you don't go on the psychedelic journey unless you have a full day of integration afterwards and a follow-up integrations with the therapist that's what it's about what did you learn what did you uncover what did you dream of whatever and um so that's what gratitude revealed is i think it's to employ the the wisdom as seen through the prism of the human condition yeah. So can I ask, um, this is really rich, and the images that uh, Dana just showed made that connection for me um, between the natural world's rhythms and then these beautiful gestures of dance, a choreography, so that the rhythms and patterns, um, they cross-reference one another. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to ask uh, Louis, and maybe you could speak a little bit more on images and healing, because mm -hmm. I've spent my professional life teaching the classics in uh, primarily Western literature, but not exclusively. Right. And um, I'm teaching a nine month course now on Dante's Divine Comedy. And I have found both in my own experiences and in uh, students' experiences, that there's some healing that takes place. You know, even in reading the Inferno, where these souls are isolated, they're self-alienated because they are self, so self-absorbed, they have no sense of who they are. But even in that suffering and that um, uh, curse of individualism, mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's a healing that can take place, not only in Dante, the pilgrim making the journey, but he has invited us to make that same journey by referring to us all the way through the poem. Reader, if you can just imagine mm. this, because I can't find the language, I, I'm not, I'm not uh, capable, I've run out of words. Um, so through language, it feels to me like the same kinds of healings can take place through the images that the words evoke in our imaginations. So any any uh, observations of be Yeah, well, as you saw in Gratitude Revealed, I mean, the film opens up with me saying that, you know, because my parents were Holocaust survivors, yes. I want to tell stories about people who overcome adversity, yet still mm -hmm. have love and hope and joy in their lives. Yeah. And those are the stories I love to tell. And so that's what gratitude revealed is really all about. Those that was the criteria of the of the stories that attracted me. And then those stories, I could lean them in a lot of different directions. Well, my, is that going to be a story about courage, about focus, about purpose, about happiness, about generosity, um, you know, curiosity, creativity. You see what I mean? Yes. Because when you find, you know, a, a bio, a character, he, he, all of you, you have all of that inside of you, That's you right. know, as yeah. you're on this sort of whatever spiritual path we're all on, you know, all of those are values that for me added up to gratitude. Yeah. And so, you know, mm -hmm. when I film those stories, the, the main arching, um, uh, 
really narrative is overcoming adversity and having love and hope in your life. Resilience. Resilience. That's really, and it's also the story of nature. Yes. Big time is resilience, you know? That yeah. little blade of grass that grows in a crack of a sidewalk, yeah. the weed refuses to be, you know, pulled out of the ground. I, I, you have to admire all that stuff, you know? Yeah. yeah. Like every time I water a plant, all of a sudden yeah, I see the ants scatter. I go, oh my God, I'm sorry about that. But then they just like reconstitute, right? Yes. It's like, <laughs> yes. Yeah. From the, the conversation. Smallest, from the smallest to the largest, they all have that energy of resilience, you know? Yes. Yeah. The conversation has touched on this in a dozen ways, but I sort of want to put on the table the healing of society, moving just a step beyond the healing of individuals and groups, but of society itself. Yeah. I have a friend, John Warner, who wrote the textbook, uh, Green Chemistry. He wrote the textbook because his son died of birth defects at two years of age, and John didn't know if he was the, the chemist who had invented the chemistry that had killed his child. He then went to the chemistry departments. He, he had gone to premise, Princeton for his PhD, found none of them taught anything about toxicity, about the byproducts of chemistry. And as he starts, so he won a presidential award for making his life's work into getting chemists to learn in the major institutions about the effects of what they're doing and how it fits and right. reaches the whole system. Well, what I've learned watching this is that was actually the theme of the industrial age. If you could do something, do it regardless of the consequences. You can name a hundred different things easily easily. And if we're going to cure our society, we have to stop being disconnected from nature. And I, I won't place the blame, but I have an idea of who the culprits are and be reconnected to nature. But when you speak, and we're often speaking to business leaders, when you speak to business leaders, you find out, well, my only incentive is profit. Yes, I hear you. We should quit doing this and we could do that better, but my bonus is based on profit. You can't get through that by preaching. You may be able to get through that by imagery, spirit, and emotion. And, and where, where I'm going with this is that I think we have to heal our society. We are going through a great transformation, whether we like it or not, yeah. because our earth has been so damaged and our population is so large We've got to rethink. It's what E.O. Wilson said, our problem with humanity is we have paleolithic emotions yeah. with medieval institutions and godlike technology. We got to right. get it to keep catch up and quickly. So, Louis, I have a really simple question for you. Yeah. What what are I want to add Dana's question about what are you thinking in terms of your projects? Because I have found this to be a very powerful way to speak to some of the hardest people, not preaching at them, right. but showing them. I, you did the scene of the termites with how nature creates its own balance. And yeah. you had the worker go through fungi and go into the nest and be turned away by the warrior termite. I mean, you know, the drama of a gun chase was nothing. I like know. the drama of what was going to happen to that termite. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I've got a number of different ones that are all kind of percolating, I think, at the same time. Obviously, all of them, I think, relate to like, you know, without sounding cliche, but elevating consciousness. Because if we don't do that, that that really is the core thing, yeah. like you're saying. Yeah. We got to get those, the people that run businesses and big corporations the uh, the only way to do that, I think, is to touch them in the heart. The yeah. the argument of global warming and and the data and the science then, has has not worked as we we know, and it certainly doesn't work with those guys. You know, to say right. well, look at the data, because you know, anyways, we we know for fifty years it hasn't worked. But to 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 make them fall in love with it, 
so they'll protect it because a lot of them do love to go hunting or fishing right or whatever that might be and to indicate that also you want that for your kids right so all those guys have kids and love their kids as well right and so if you want to pass your culture your life your your values whatever your your way of life you know which is like you know hunting barbecue whatever that might be well then we need to protect the environment in order to do that and that's i think one way of, of bridging it so that's what i'm trying to do and i think you know with, with gratitude revealed there's a lot of red states in there there's a lot of blue collar people in there there's a lot of folks that are rural you know, which which is actually more interesting for me to film because some guy that sits behind a desk in a tall office building is boring, as can be. <laughs> but that's why I love stories about people who you know live off the land and um, are are doing work. You know, dairy farmers, cowboys, jazz musician, whatever the bike bike messenger. You know, those are cool jobs uh, and better and more interesting to film. <laughs> so. Um, so that's what I'm, I think I'm trying to do. I'd like to say that we're all alike. We're all just a different version of each other because what we have to have a bridge. You you can't say I'm right, you're wrong, even though we're right and they're wrong. You you can't do that. It doesn't work, right? I saw, there was always a great quote, like if you have to choose between being right and wrong, choose kindness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've seen most of your work on a small screen, although I have seen some in a theater. But in, I think it was one of the first Gratitude movies, your films were projected on buildings. Yeah. And the performance aspect of this writ large in a very public kind of way and they do most more of this in Europe than I think they do here, where I've seen them in big plazas where they broadcast on the side of a building. Yeah. This could cool. be, it could be, among other things, it gets people into a public space. And when we bump and rub shoulders, it's like Woodstock or the festivals of music in the 60s that we had, you know, and until those kind of turned violent they were pretty cool things look when you mentioned we, when we projected on the vatican for example that's where it was yes it was the vatican i mean but what that that was to support uh the pope's encyclical to protect the environment and this was a day before the vote on you know in paris you know on the cop 21 i think right and so um that was beautiful and the power of that was incredible that's like by far the biggest projection I've, I've ever experienced. And it all happened at the last second. And for me, I'd like to, you know, just say that how emotional it was because, you know, like we were, you know, the night before there was a rehearsal. Um, we got all these, you know, projectors. We're trying to line them up. And I realized, and I thought of the fact that, you know, um, that the Vatican was silent during World War II when it came to the Holocaust, when it came to the roundup of Jews. I mean, they could have easily have saved the Jews of Italy or the Jews of Rome had someone just said, thou shalt not kill. And I started going on to this negative spiral, you know, a bit. And I looked over my shoulder and I said, we're gonna just, we're gonna just like kill them with love. <laughs> just bla we're gonna blast light into the darkness, you know? And the miracle that the son of Holocaust survivors could be there at the Vatican with the Pope watching and putting beauty on the Vatican, that blows my mind. Well, that's a win-win situation. And you're using the model of nature as a teaching tool to, to let people see the way forward is by evolving themselves in relation to an image that is just coming alive and they're saying my god look at look at this this is just i'm in awe i'm in wonder this is where i think it could get surgical you know it and this is where you know for me probably because i'm a student of dennis's it's all about mimesis 
And mimesis, if you go back to Percy Shelley's, I, it, who may be the most dangerous person to have ever lived, the, his ability as a, to, as a poet made him an incredibly dangerous person. And what he was able to see is like, look, if there's a pattern in nature that's the same as a pattern in me, then I'm going to see me and it, that clarifies my mimesis. But when I try to talk about this, I normally tend to give a very specific example uh, for my students. And I'm like, imagine a flower and imagine a rubber band around a flower trying to open. Immediately, my students who are 18 years old, most of them, know exactly what it's like to be a flower that's trying to open against some kind of resistance. That's something you feel at that stage in your life. But also, I would say that if you look at the Democrats and the Republicans and their attitudes on individual rights, the Democrats core concept of individual rights is I have a right to not be tread on. No, everybody has a right to not be trampled. The individual right is a right to not be infringed upon. So you might see the, uh, a right for the flower to not be trampled and skewn about. But for Republicans, the individual right they're primarily concerned with is the right to be awesome themselves, the right to grow, the right to thrive. Not, they don't, it's not about being trampled on. That's not their concern. It's about the right to be an excellent and amazing individual. It's the right to not have a rubber band around their flower. And so I think about how surgical it could get and how targeted the audiences could be with the imagery and the projection mm. to reach somebody in an unconscious way with what you're trying to get them to get. And I wonder, is that, you know, not just to move people that, that need to get things more clearly, but also to heal people with right. their very specific I wonder, is, are you interested in taking this, this visual healing stuff into a, a new level of research or uh, a study or collaboration to try and see how, how nuanced and detailed it can get? Absolutely. It's actually what I'm doing uh, in about a month or two at, at uh, UCSF, University of California in San Francisco at the Neuroscape Lab. And um, one of the... the most important things I think we need to really understand is we say, okay, is nature good for you? Then the next question should be, what kind of nature? If I said, mm -hmm. music's good for you, then you'd say, what kind of music? Heavy metal? Or is it Tibetan bowls? Or is it rock and roll? You know, I mean, it's too broad. So we don't, what, yeah. what I have put together, and we're going to use state-of-the-art digital capture technology to record the data is to put together these ecosystems and say, is there a difference between looking at a, a time-lapse flower or flying over a glacier, you know? There definitely there, is, and you're going to get us some details. That's amazing. Yeah, I, I hope so, that, that there is a difference. And then the exciting part would be, if that's true, like in Ayurvedic, you know, medicine, you can say, okay, if, if you're like, what you need, if, if you're fire, you need water. You talk about balance. It isn't just about... I really love the ocean. I think I want more ocean. I mean, it might be, if you look at that, you know, thousands of years of, of medical, you know, um, practice in, in India, and it's pretty amazing, you know, knowledge that does exist there. What if you applied some of that with the findings you discover over here? What's the desert like? What's the underwater like? What's a forest like? I mean, I love them all. Terry, you said you watched them all. We got, I mean, they all have different vibrations. Mm -hmm. They all have different, you know, completely beautiful um, worlds that are all really the same at the same time, right? Because they all go by the laws of nature, of physics and, you know, all of that. Um, but they're just, they're, they're different like examples of each other, which is so cool, right? I mean, you're showing up here talking to an, a group of us that are like mythologists and dream psychologists saying that you might actually go do some real studies with how specific imagery affects healing yeah. and responses. I mean, that's, that's dream and all meanings of the word dream uh, for us. And I, I hope as you get down that road, we'll get to hear more about it and share more about it with everybody who's in part of this. It's no. it's really remarkable that it uh, it's great that it's really never been done before. As, as I said earlier, it's the most important sensory receptor we have is and more important now than ever as, as we're all spending ninety percent of our time on a digital screen uh, of some sort, either this or that or whatever, right? And 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 it's a miracle of what goes on in your brain that electrical impulses translated by an optic nerve sending signals through these neurological pathways 
it is not a giant movie theater in my head. You know, it's not. It's all this electrical neurological pathways that are being activated. And just that alone blows your mind. <laughs> you know, right? before we get off, sorry, Dana. I, so if, if I can, just one one other okay. thing about this particular uh, uh, line of thought is that is is time, healing, and when winness. And it's like so much of this imagery. It's not just like okay, flowers are pretty. No, flowers right. are when. Flowers are between seed and fruit. It is the when that is the healingness of the image is the wenness of the tree, the wenness of the seed, the wenness of the, and actually one thing I'm, I'm curious if, because you said it and I wonder if it's intuitive to, to you, but is there a wenness to gratitude to you? Oh, wow. Yeah, there, I, I think so. I would say if I had to pick one, it's in reflection. Hmm. It's in remembering that beautiful moment you had with your family or whatever. And, and that, it lives in your heart for a long time. The wedding, well, whatever it might be, you know what I'm saying? You're grateful mm -hmm. for when that event occurred, which I think is a little bit different than appreciation, which for me is more in the moment. Because you're, you're, we're talking to you like you're a photographer a lot of the times, but you're also, it's the time stuff that you're doing yeah. that's really profound. You're <laughs> a time lord, you know? And, and that is, uh, that's what unlocks so much of this patterns that we don't get to see literally like the jpl they got voyager getting out to the limits of space you know but right. also we need to get to the limits of, of what we can see in our world through yeah. what you're doing with scale yeah and and time is this giant illusion we have that it's a clock that goes around obviously all meditative practices want to achieve this idea that you're in the moment that there is no past there is no future so this is really also the crux of spirituality you might say or some type of meditative conscious path is to be in the moment and the fact that i show you that look this thing that you're calling time is bs because i'm slowing it down i'm speeding it up i'm showing you what a flower you know does in 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 two days in five seconds you know it's like hello you know <laughs> live in the world of the hummingbird live in the world of the flower these are all you know invisible worlds which is a shamanic that are thing real to do. That, but these are all real it isn't like CGI of like doing a fantasy, like a Star Wars uh, fact, you know, fiction thing, because you know it's not real. How nutritious can the non-real AI imagery be? Yeah. 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 Compared it's to what you're talking. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but but it is it is like really nutrition right out of real nature, because that's the real hearty stuff. And we are yeah. getting further and further away from reality as the source of the imagery, even. Right. Right. You know, well, that that brings up the thought. I was going to talk about it earlier, ask a question about it. But a lot of work is being done with VR these days and putting people into Oculus headsets therapeutically. And I mean, they, they can't do it any other way, but they can immerse a consciousness in this. Have you ever seen your work put into like an Oculus set? I'm not there because... I mean, I've, I've shot some stuff early on. So a couple of drawbacks, the resolution's not there. And mm -hmm. the, and in the, in the resolution is the secret code of what we call okay. beauty, what turns you on. Looking at the little fine little lines in the butterfly wing. If you don't see that, then you're missing it. It's like listening mm -hmm. to music where you, mm -hmm. you, you know, that's compressed. You don't have the highs, you don't have the lows. <clears throat> it's different. So that's one reason. Also in healthcare, they're all concerned about germs. And so that's a problem if you went from one headset to another. And I, even in, in people that are not, you know, patients, most people don't want to wear it for more than 10 or 12 minutes. Mm -hmm. And so what I would, what I prefer for now is the giant, um, you know, 4K screen where the price gets lower and lower and lower every year, yeah. you know, and um, you can move your head, you can move your eyes. And 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 really get into the detail, and, and it's also more affordable for everybody. So it isn't just for an elitist okay. group. And you go to Costco, you get like a sixty-inch TV now for like nine hundred dollars. And an eight HD came out. Remember, it's like a twenty-inch monitor it was like fifteen thousand dollars. Wow. <laughs> it's right. like and really, 
Yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Well, I was going to say, Louie, one thing that I want to touch on, because I'm mindful we're going into the end zone here by no. time, but um, this is a crowd that really resonates deeply with like shamanic journeys or indigenous. Um, can you, because I think your nature, your, your work really honors those areas. Yeah. Um, I, maybe it's just a more modern way of honoring the, uh, the, the natural rhythms and patterns that indigenous people always did, you know, because I, I've, I've had a couple of like indigenous, you know, leaders see my work and they see it as shamanic because basically, you know, I make the invisible visible there. And there's another way to do it. That's like ayahuasca when psychedelics can also open up portals into, um, you know, mystical realms that I think are similar, you know, because again, I'm bending you, bending time and scale, and you're altering perception, and so um, they saw it as "quote unquote" shamanic because, um, it, as Dana brilliantly described it, it look it, it feels like I'm looking at at the divine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. And what and if you get us, Corinne, I just I think it's what you said so valuable. I, I want to make sure we don't sure. skip over the shamanic thing. Um, when you give us perspective through different animals and through different, that is one of the most shamanic yeah. things you can do is, is to right. be the animals, tr see through all these different perspectives. And you literally deliver those perspectives to us right. so that our inner shaman that we all have can engage. That's totally true. That's the whole point of, you know, uh, being with the hummingbird, you know, and slowing it down and uh, 80 beats per, per second, you know, down to like one beat, you know, a second is like, that's their world. You know, that's how they see things. They, they float. They don't even fall down in altitude. It's like how cool it is to understand that world. Instead, we just see them as <laughs> gone. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's great. And one other thing, because I know there's, um, we have a lot of East Coasters that join these. And um, Louis, I'd love if you would talk about the New York, of uh, Alex Gray, oh. could talk about, yeah. So there's probably a lot of Alex Gray fans in the audience. And then there's also people from the East Coast, from Boston, New York. And can you talk a little bit about sure. that event? Because well, yeah. yeah, so we're going to have an event in New York City at Symphony Space, June 16th. And um, it's going to be just a celebration of gratitude. But more than just the movie, um, you know, there's a giant screen. I think I'm going to have some energy in the very beginning that'll take us into the movie. And then I'm going to have a conversation with Alex and Allison Gray. They do visual, um, visionary art, which is, you know, inspired a lot by psychedelics, but like, you know, looking through your body and seeing the network of your nervous system mm -hmm. and your capillary system and all that. Um, and then Rob Garza from Thievery Corporation as a musician to have what we're doing now, a bit of a, a conversation. And then I'll let Rob take off and, and be a DJ, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, I just, I wanted to make these more than a, a, a watching a movie because it's like, if you don't like what's going on in the world, throw a better party. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you like do you like the performance aspect and the presentation aspect of your work? Well, I, I like the idea of being, you know, in front of people, real people. Yeah. And in in a movie, it's really great in the back of the theater to hear when people laugh or cry mm -hmm. or something. That that's the only feedback because the process of making it is very difficult. And I'm very not isolating. Anymore. Well, it's like it's work. It's time and money. It's like, did I get the best shot? And, uh, and you're fighting for perfection, that, that addiction you mentioned earlier. So I'm never happy with what I got because it could have been better. So that's all a struggle. And you don't get the feedback until you're with the audience for me because mm -hmm. um, it's just like, you know, building this block by block. So that that is part of it. Well, I forgot, what was the question? Let me the, oh, about, no, about no, performance no. and all about that performance kind of, okay so because so that's the thing in the vatican is performance exactly and, no, and, and, and now i no, i totally love the energy of it uh yeah like beyond that and this is really important too like i'm in july i'm going to be doing a big presentation at tomorrowland you know that's the largest music festival on the planet okay mm -hmm. it's in europe and belgium outside of belgium and it'll be like 
on a 40 foot screen, 8,000 young people. I did another one at core. I mean, see if I, if I am able to turn young people on again, without them even knowing it, I'm just showing them really cool imagery with EDM music that, of nature that leans a little bit more towards abstract or, um, you know, time and scale manipulation, but not um, CGI or mm -hmm. any like fancy special effect, then um, I'm turning them on. Yeah, that's the thing. That's yeah, it. That's Period. awesome. You know, right. and they won't even know it. No, most of all, I'd say a lot of them will know it. I mean, they'll look, oh, wow, look at that. It's a flower. Or, oh, wow, it's a bat. And they'll fall in love with it. But then there'll be also some people who uh, will had never seen it before and then will be inspired to go do a deeper dive. Yeah. Are, are you shooting your work on film or digital? Digital now. It's since all about digital. Two so you have control over speed and all that. It doesn't matter how much you burn up. Yeah, I don't have to worry about the money as much as I used to. Yeah. When I started, though, but here's the miracle is that I started doing everything in 35 millimeter, right? which is a good thing because going back to 1970, everything I filmed, I can scan to 4K. And that's what the first Netflix shows were. So um, once digital, I thought, was better than film, you know, I switched over. But even back then, as a kid with no money, coming out of college, Film was a hundred bucks a minute for raw mm. stock development process. Compare that to today, the and that's nineteen seventy dollars. Louis, can I? And it weighed and it weighed a pound. It also yes. weighed a pound. So if you traveled anywhere, you got ten minutes of film. You got ten pounds. You got a hundred mm -hmm. pounds. We're talking some serious security checks. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you get what, so much what, better resolution with digital too. So that part about resolution that you were talking about, like mm -hmm. really inviting people to surrender, um, right? Yeah. So every time there's been this new stuff, three D, AI, VR, all this stuff, I've only focused on one thing: resolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's all for me. That's what it's all about, and then it can always be applied to these other, you know, emerging technologies. Yeah. Um, but resolution is just like a musician. You want to record it like in the highest bandwidth uh, that you can, because otherwise you're not going to hear any, all the instruments. Yeah. Dennis. So I ask you um, just as we're coming to the end and I couldn't ask it before now, yeah. because listening to you and getting the sense of who you are, um, what's your myth? Mm. What's, the, what's the myth that, I don't want to be a little bit. How do you how do you define myth? Yeah. How what do you is, define myth? Yeah. What gets you up out of bed in the morning? That's that's a huge part of your myth. Right. Um, what assumptions do you carry with you? And not just you, but any of us. Yeah. Um, I think our assumptions carry a, a, a the mother load. Right. Assumptions and beliefs. Uh, those are those are for me two of the large infrastructures. That um, that characterize a, a myth, a personal myth. I mean, yeah. it's a societal myth and so forth. But I'm just thinking about I, you. Yeah, I, I would perhaps say that the core would be that everything is energy, and life is change. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everything mm -hmm. is energy. Everything yeah. is energy. That's Gosh, you are you are basically Heraclitus reborn over here, right? And yes. it makes so much freaking sense. Heraclitus, the one who says you can't step in the same river twice. The one who says everything is fire burning out and going, burning and burning out in measures. And that everything is the logos, the logos being the pattern of change and everything. And he is the one where you, <clears throat> I've watched your films and had some uh, quasi spiritual responses to the time lapses of flowers stuff. Yeah. And there's a, a movement through time that you just feel when you see it. It's really profound and it has that that feeling. I remember thinking about Heraclitus, you know, even when I was watching it. So yeah. too cool to hear you say it that way. Well, yeah. thank you. I mean, nope. the, what happens maybe when we die or when we're born, whatever, is is also going to a different time frame, probably, obviously, yeah. you know. And and then and because of that, then maybe that's why you feel reconnected to the divine, mm. you know, because uh 
Yeah, I mean, we're, we're all trying to really understand the great mystery, right? Mm -hmm. I, that, was, that was what I felt, just like, we're all going forward. There's a forwardness happening, and it is going to keep happening. Yeah. But we'll also recollection. I mean, mm -hmm. and, uh, Louis brought it up earlier. It's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the movement of Dante's poem. Maybe it's the movement of all poetry. It's this forward motion in recollection. So it's a mm. spiral. The spiral works for me better than the circle mm -hmm. because it, fold, it moves forward, but it folds back on itself, but not where it used to be. It's, it's a little bit above or a little bit below, and then it's out again and back. And yeah, so I just want to a, a yeah. plug for recollection. What I'm noticing too is that it's not only Kronos, we're talking about Kairos mm -hmm. because that what you I was really moved by what you said earlier about needing to be in a state of awe and wonder when you're filming. It's like um, cooking with love that it yeah. creates a synergy that's um, mm -hmm. you know a mystery, the synergy, but that you're you're in, invoking magical time you know, the place between time and Kronos. So it's that wonderful paradox mm. between the two. Yeah, because it's easy to get sucked into, unfortunately, the functional, mechanical, um, or actually computer uh, world of filming nowadays, you know? Because uh, mm. if you mess up on one of those, you screwed up the whole shot. So you have to have your act together, you know? Yeah. And that can take you out of that feeling. Um, but that's what I, that's why I, I'm aware of that. And I, I tried to go back to it before I pressed the button. It makes it a sacrament. It makes it a prayer. Yeah, yeah. I get it all get it all yeah. dialed in and then remember why I got all excited to do all the work to get it all dialed in, you know. Yeah. Have you ever given any thought to what you would like your legacy to be? Never uh, thought of, um I don't know, turn people on to discovering that they are, um, that, that this is heaven on earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love your spirituality. Mm -hmm. I really do. I, mm -hmm. I, I love the sense that you are, you trust the moment. You know, who you are is totally prepared to deal with whatever it is that you need to do. So you, you, make, filmmaking is a good uh, gives you a lot of good experience to uh, adjust and you know pivot constantly. Coming back to what you just said and and the film gratitude, one of the things I meant to mention is uh, I was recently reading some uh, work by Steiner, and Steiner's talking about initiations into the higher realms and spiritual journeys, and he eventually gets into like. You know, anything you've ever read and could ever hope to read is only ever preparation for the real stuff, which is in, in life. And that if you want to go on any real initiation past the reading, if you want to engage with any actual teacher, whether it's life or a mentor, the place to start with that whole journey, and somebody said it's something like this in your film, is gratitude. Gratitude is the starting emotion yeah. for learning, for going, and for, for participating, uh, and for learning and and you know uh it was profound to hear that said in your film and i wonder if you have any thoughts about that gratitude yeah is a, well because yeah. i think it's it's so it's so easy for any of us i think to just be grateful for something the smallest little thing and by doing that you're you're actually doing a big thing which is stopping the negative spiral stopping the rumination you can't be oh. thinking negatively and positively at the same time so you're just at least giving it a break put it on pause and when you start thinking of what you can appreciate that's right in front of you it's always the little things like my fingers move i'm breathing i mean my god like so many things would come in, into your consciousness that you can be grateful for and that is the essence of the practice you i mean it's not like you have to go learn to be a tibetan monk and figure out how to be a you know a meditation master you you're already doing it and by doing that you're making the world a kinder place that's right yep
they'll say that knowledge is not a prerequisite for wisdom, nor is it wisdom itself. It seems that the way you're describing it is that gratitude is actually the heart's way to be to find wisdom. Yeah, actually, gr gratitude, G-R-A, grail, green, hmm. uh, grotto. The, we talked about it last time, actually, it came up. G-R-A is a, is a heck of a prefix. It's an it's a early a piece of word, and that has to do with that same stuff, that, that heart, that vitality, the green, that which springs up. Um, and so I think gratitude actually shares in that family of meaning with the grail. And with the longer, green. The longer that we stay in the impulse to practice gratitude, we find the path to salvation, some sort of forgiveness for being in the world, for not being grateful. And whenever we tap into gratitude, it, we can do it just walking along the street. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't take a profound action, but it does take repetition. Yeah, and obviously everyone knows that like, you know, they have scientific data that if you journal three things every day, at the beginning of the day, end of the day, whenever you want to do it, it helps you, helps helps you physiologically, biologically, it, it improves your health. Mm -hmm. So, you know, why not do it? And definitely probably improves your, your, your mental health as well, obviously, and your relationships with other people. Well, it builds trust and it diminishes fear. I think, I think it does all the things that we expect something that heals us to do. And that's contagious. Isn't that you said, you said something about heaven on earth and it made me want to say one other thing about yeah. uh, uh, Tolkien. And um, you, we've talked, bringing the heaven on earth concept next to the other concept, which is to, to learn from nature as opposed to just from these derivative forms of myth or maps we've created, but go back to the source of nature, go back to where the, the message of heaven may really be coming from. And, and I just wanted to bring in Tolkien uh, and his idea of mythopoesis and the very conversion of C.S. Lewis to Catholicism is kind of secondary and boring compared to what the conversion really was. The real conversion was a conversion from literal interpretation of things to the mythopoetic interpretation of things. And what Tolkien said to him is he's like, look, I'm an author. I got no problem authoring metaphors into my stories. <laughs> you think if there's an author, they're not authoring metaphors into the thing that we're doing here in nature? So if you want, if you think there's anything anywhere beyond here that has anything to say, where else are you going to look? But nature. Yeah. L Louis, in your uh, medical clinical research, yeah. are you going to look at, have you looked at, does watching your films create the same biological responses as meditation? Mm. Oh, I, I definitely believe that's true. Yeah. Well, I think it's true for me. But I, I'm really curious yeah, about. Well, hopefully, we'll be able to record it now because, with like you know, like EEG and those you know wave, recording wave wave patterns, we'll be able to say whether that's true or not. Yeah, I I think a lot of people in the hyper society, that you know, businesses typical of have a very hard time becoming present. Yeah clearing their mind and focusing. And what the films do for me is I get drawn in. I, you know, the, just the image of the hummingbird who's doing that 360 degree. All I have to do is remember that. Yeah. And it, it elevates my spirit. And I know that has to do with also a physiological reaction. And I'm just wondering if we can get some scientific proof that this is actually a way to help hyper people get more centered. Yeah, well, look, if you can trigger the wonder and awe emotion, yes. then you are able, then serotonin is released and all kinds of you know hormones are released throughout your body. Same thing happens when you make love. I mean, it's like um, there's a whole chemical flush of, of energy that occurs. And that happens, obviously, um, I think by triggering the wonder and awe, beauty, you know, triggering those emotions, it doesn't have to be real, you know, you, it can happen when you're reading a book, it happens if you're reading a poem, right?
Yeah. So if you trigger the emotion in a really powerful way um, and you shed tears, you know, then obviously it's real. Yeah. But as you say, it's not triggering oxytocin. It's triggering serotonin. It's yeah. it's it's a it's a peace. It's a, a joy. It's not a it's not a aggression and an anger and a right. Well, it's it's, it's what's already in your body. <laughs> you know, See, it's I'm natural. A, a, it, it's like we all want to feel pleasure. Nothing wrong with that at all. We all want to feel good. We all want to feel when I say turned on that feeling of elevation of of, of realizing that this is like. A miracle we're here breathing and all that so we want to feel that all you know we definitely want to feel it and if that's a way to trigger it if chocolate's a way to trigger it <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of ways to trigger it you know riding a wave you know extreme <laughs> sports you know um sinking a, a ball from the three-point line or whatever you know mm -hmm. there's so many ways of triggering it that's what we want to do Louis, you are an absolute pleasure. Okay. I really, I, I am so inspired by you. And Corinne, I love our brainstorming. I just love when we get together and we start doing these things because they do. And Terry, thank you for responding to this. And Mickey, good to see you again. Dennis, Will, all right, let's, let's, have, let's have a moment of silence. Bless you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. All Thank right. You, Louis. Thank you, Louis. Will. And all the gratitude. Thank you. Terry Thank you. and Corinne and Michael. And what a wonderful evening. Really? Thank you.